What makes a good memoir? Who it's about? The plot? Or maybe it's the writing? More people than ever are asking those questions as they decide to write their own life stories, only to realize that memoir writing and putting themselves out there for all to see doesn't come easily to everyone. That's where Alison Latta comes in. She's an instructor at the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies, and she joins us now for her insights on the art of the memoir. Hello. Alison, welcome. Thank it's you. so nice to have you here. Great to be here. I'll be taking notes while you're speaking because I really would like to pursue this one day. <laughs> um, but what attracted you to memoir writing? I had been an editor for quite a number of years before I became interested in memoir writing in the way that I am now. I was, um, I'd been editing books for six years and editing other things long before that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really nothing to do with the editing that got me into memoir. It was um, an interest, a very sudden interest when I was 42 in genealogy. Really? And um, which I don't, th I don't think it's unusual for people to be interested suddenly at that age. Mm -hmm. You get pa past the middle of your life and you start thinking back. Uh, before that, I had never really cared about where my family came from mm -hmm. or anything like that. And suddenly, we, we had a trip to England, mm -hmm. and uh, on the trip to England, I was got became fascinated with finding out about one of my family lines. Came back and was like a dog with a bone and started studying all the family lines. Do you have um, roots in England? We have a family from England, Ireland, Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and, and one, the Latta family has been uh, in Canada since the 1700s. So that one was easy to, to trace. Yeah. Um, but what became very clear quickly with the genealogy was what was lacking, and that was the stories. Because when you're studying genealogy, often all you get is dates, mm -hmm. you know, birth dates, death dates, wedding dates, um, maybe somebody's job, but you don't get the actual stories behind it. So that, that started me thinking about, you know, people and how they should be writing their <laughs> stories down. Um, there were a couple of other things too, though, that happened around that time as well. My, um, my, a friend of mine's father presented a memoir to his family at, a, at his 80th birthday party that he had been working on secretly. That's so and so this was a surprise for them, for yeah. his kids, his adult kids and his grandchildren. And, um, and it was just, uh, you know, typed and spiral bound, I think. Mm -hmm. Something very, very simple, not edited. But the family was so thrilled. My friend was so thrilled. And when I saw how touched they were, I thought, really, everybody could do this mm -hmm. in some form or another if they really wanted to. Um, and then the third thing was that my mother, around that time, uh, developed Alzheimer's. And it was right around the time I was starting to try to get family stories from my father. Mm -hmm. It was successful with him. He was a good storyteller. But then when I started asking my mother, I realized that she didn't really, she wasn't able to remember certain things. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, a writing guru, William Zinser, who says uh, um, one of the saddest sentences he knows is, I wish I'd asked my mother that. It reminds me, too, of something that Alex Haley wrote, that when someone dies, it's like a library is being burnt down because it's like all those stories are gone. That's right, yeah. Was there any story in your family that you didn't know that you found out when you were exploring this? Uh, oh, lots. Yeah. The, the thing that I realized when I was... I worked with my father for a little bit, and that was how I segued into teaching, actually. I, I was getting some stories from my father. He lived in Victoria, so I was sending him writing prompts and getting him to write me stories and send them back to me. Mm -hmm. And um, he, the two things that came out of that were that, first of all, he didn't know what I didn't know. Because I would ask him things, and he'd say, well, surely you know that. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, well, Dad, I was a kid. How would I know? And the other thing was um, that he, he expected me to he didn't know what I would be interested in. So I realized that he really needed the prompts in order to do the writing, because without them, he didn't really know where to start. And when you first star started, um, what was it like? Was there a lot of people interested in memoir writing when you first started? There were, but I would say this was 12 or so years ago, and there's been a, a, an incredible explosion in interest in in writing memoir. Mm -hmm. um, back then, you could find the odd course or workshop here or there, but nothing like there is now. And, and I, I'm sure it's the, 
the aging population, it's also the internet and social media making it easier for people to connect mm -hmm. and to do the research they want to do and also to share stories and so on. But I would say within the last 10, 15 years, that's really been a change. Now, what's the difference between a memoir and, and autobiography? Uh, that's one of the things that students are often really surprised about when I explain it to them, mm -hmm. an autobiography is really the story of a person's entire life. From birth, it's factual, it's a bit more like a history, um, and it's chronological. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't write an autobiography when you were 40. Most people would write one when they're, when they're in their senior years. But a memoir can be uh, as short as a thousand words, even shorter actually. Mm -hmm. um, and that surprises people too. They come into my workshops uh, thinking that a memoir has to be a book. But there are, there's a lot, and again, because of the internet, there's a lot of opportunity for writing shorter stories about your life. Mm -hmm. uh, but the memoir is mo written more like a novel. The idea is that you put a frame around some aspect of your life, uh, topical or thematic or a particular relationship or whatever it might be, and you make a story out of it using things like dialogue and description, and you make it into a story. So, but also it can be any length. Mm -hmm. So that's a relief to a lot I of people. I didn't know that. I always yeah. thought that a memoir had to be like a complete book. So no. it could be a thousand words, which is a couple of pages. Yeah, there are lots of uh, magazines now that mm -hmm. uh, that publish creative nonfiction and memoir that's 750 words, a thousand words. And that so. would be for like a particular event that happened, like one story, right? Mm -hmm. It could be a, yeah, often it's a particular event or a mm -hmm. particular relationship. Uh, it, they're, they're simpler, obviously, mm -hmm. than a longer memoir would be. Um, the, the focus has to be tighter, mm -hmm. but that's the difference. And what are some things that sparks your, uh, like spark your students' interest in writing a memoir? Uh, why do they come to mm -hmm. the workshops? Uh, all sorts of reasons, some of them, want to just write it for themselves. They want to write um, to remember the past and to keep to make a record of the past for themselves. Others uh, are working with a family member, a, a parent or a grandparent, and they're trying to help them. And, and it's more of a blend of memoir and family history. Um, other people have a story that they feel that they really want to tell and get get it out there about some experience they've had. They think it will help other people. Uh, so some of them come just for themselves and others come because they are hoping to get published someday or to self-publish. And how strong is their writing when they start? It really depends on the workshop. Mm -hmm. At U of T, they're, they're stronger, I think, in general than some workshops I teach just because um, it's, it's a program, you know, and there's an expense involved, so there's a commitment and investment. Um, but, uh, but it ranges. It ranges in every workshop. Mm -hmm. But there's often a lot of talent there that just needs to be uncovered. And uh, what are some of the things that people write about? Oh my goodness, everything mm -hmm. you could imagine. But like what uh, would make a good memoir topic? Well, good memoirs are usually about uh, personal challenges, mm -hmm. something that you've been through that through which you've you've evolved as a person, as a as a as a character in the book, but as a person in real life. So challenges could be anything. It could be a relationship. It could be um, it could be illness. It could be travel experiences. Um, all sorts of things. Really, anything I think can make a good story if it's told well. And what are some of your favorite memoirs? That's hard because I've re I read so many of them. Yeah. I love Angela's um, Ashes, but I think a lot of people say that, don't they? Yes, I like Angela's Ashes too. Yeah. Um, the Boy in the Moon by Ian Brown, which I copy edited. Um, what was that about? That was about his, his son Walker, who has a genetic mutation, mm -hmm. and about his experiencing his, his, his experience and his wife's with parenting him, and really very moving story. Uh, but going back, I loved I, Isaac Dennison's Out of Africa. I love um, anything by Julian Barnes. He's a British author. I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. um, who else? The Glass Castle is very popular. That comes up a lot mm -hmm. with my students. It's very, very well read and well thought of. Uh, there's, there's so many. I love travel yeah. memoir as well. Yeah. And how do you handle like um, writing about something traumatic 
or a tragedy? But what I advise people is that uh, if they want to write about their lives, they need to write about the texture of their lives, which means also the tragic parts or the sad parts, the darker parts. And that if they find that difficult, that often it's a good idea to just step away from that for a little bit and write about other things and then try to come back to it. I don't want anybody to do it to the point that they're trauma re-traumatized, mm -hmm. but sometimes it just takes a few runs at it. And, and there's also a, a scientist in the States, Dr. Pen James Pennebaker, who's done some studies on writing to heal. And in his studies, he talks about the the process of writing about, about difficult life events and how if you repeatedly write about something, the process of writing about it helps you to work through it mm. in some way. So there is a, there, there can be a healing aspect to some of the memoir writing that people do. Now recently with um, a lot of memoirs, there's been a lot of female successful writers. Uh, a, a, lot, a lot of successful memoirs have been written by women. And there's been a little bit of criticism about that. In England, they call it literary, misery literature. Uh, do you think that that's unfair? Because it's kind of attacking, saying that women, the only thing that women can write about is trauma and you know, claiming that they're victims, et cetera. I think it's very unfair when, when people categorize like that. To me, it seems a good book is a good book. A good memoir is a good memoir. Uh, the irony is probably that originally, historically, memoirs or autobiographies mm -hmm. back then were written all by men. They were written by military figures, political figures. Um, I think one of the best, me the best-selling memoirs still of all time was written by Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> so the fact that women are writing memoirs is is a newer thing. Mm -hmm. um, the misery memoirs issue is sort of a different issue, but um, I don't think that's necessarily just women doing that and it's something that that uh, it's questionable whether that will keep going I mean really the readership is what will decide that if people are reading the book it must be an interesting book so which leads me to this next question like how important is authenticity in a memoir absolutely mm -hmm. important it's uh, I would say the things that are important in a memoir are, are honesty and authenticity vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, being uh, um, willing to show your own flaws mm -hmm. in, in the process of writing it. Uh, a memoir is not very interesting if you whitewash yourself and then everyone else is criticized. So, so there's also some memoirs that are written where people are very, uh, you know, they're blaming. So there's, mm -hmm. there's, I often talk in workshops about how people shouldn't be writing to blame or to be vindictive or to take revenge on anyone. It's not about that. And you have to be as critical about yourself as a character as you are about the other characters in your book. That's really interesting. Yeah, and also yeah. show compassion. That's another thing, because there, people will say, well, this person did me wrong, you yeah. know, so how do I write about him? And I'll say, well, you know, you have to, if you don't show compassion, showing the compassion is, is something the reader will see as a characteristic of you. Mm -hmm. Right, so at this, you're softening your approach to this other character, and at the same time, you're also revealing part of yourself um, that's positive. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we always we think that memoir it's written by one person, but there's an editor involved. So how do you fall into that? Well, every good book has yeah. e has editors behind it. I was I, I would say. Writing a book is one person, but often to produce a book takes a village. <laughs> so how do you keep that, so, you know, that uh, authenticity then? Uh, the, well, the, the author, part of being an editor, mm -hmm. if you're a good editor, is to try to preserve the writer's voice. So, uh, and that's something that's, that's not always easy. It's mm -hmm. a challenge. Sometimes you get better at it over time, I think. I hope I'm, I've gotten better <laughs> at it. But uh, it's something that um, is very important because the editor can't take over or change the voice of a story. And you've worked with some well-known authors. Who are some of the people that you've worked with? Uh, in terms of uh, fiction and memoir, all mm -hmm. sorts of people, um, Lawrence Hill, uh, Catherine Govia, um, Catherine Gildener, I worked on one of her memoirs. 
my a lot of my work for publishers, which has been over the last 20 years, has been copy editing, mm -hmm. uh, some proofreading, and occasionally structural editing, which is an earlier in the process. But every book requires a whole team of editors, really, that have various functions. And that's something a lot of people don't know. And a lot of times, students don't realize that until they're told they think that they don't, they don't know that there will be all these steps involved in bringing a book out into the world. It has many, many, many parents. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and what is it about these writers' memoirs that, have, that has made them so successful? Some of the people that you've mentioned, like Lawrence Hill. Um, well, Lawrence Hill's memoir was uh, Blackberry Sweet Juice. That was that was a long that was a while ago that that one came out. Um, you know, I guess in general, it's just the same things that would make any memoir readable, because they are often these people aren't necessarily famous before they write the memoir. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they aren't. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's it's the same things: authenticity, vulnerability. Um, a willingness to show your 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 flaws, um, a, a, giving the reader a sense that you're taking them on a journey, that it's not meandering, that there is a purpose, there's a destination that you're aiming for at the end of the book, and that when they get to that destination, mm -hmm. the reader feels um, feels like they have a, a gift. Is how I often describe it. You know that that you you've got a gift of some sort that you've received as the reader. That's lovely. And that at the la in the last few pages, mm -hmm. there's something that makes that journey really worthwhile. So it gives you something to think about, a different way of thinking about people or the world, life, and about yourself. There's one author I remember talking to, and she said that when she speaks to a group about her book, if somebody comes up. And afterwards, and says to her, mm -hmm. um, I, I, "I wants to talk about her story. She feels she's failed. If the person walks up and wants to talk about their story, what the what her story triggered in them, she feels she succeeded." And I thought that was really interesting because it's probably the reverse of what most of us would, would imagine expect. an author wants, mm -hmm. right? But it's that connection between the reader's story and. Uh, sorry, the, the writer's story and the reader that is uh, so important. And you can identify with, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, you recently helped edit a memoir by an author named Alexandra Risen called mm -hmm. Unearthed. Yes. Who is she? So she was one of my students at U of T. Mm -hmm. uh, she originally took a course from another instructor about writing about nature mm -hmm. because she has this beautiful garden that's uh, in Rosedale that she and her husband, they bought the house and uh, the garden was in a state and so it's a beautiful huge garden so they, there was a lot that was involved in restoring it. Mm -hmm. But then she took my course and she was writing some personal stories and decided that she wanted to meld the two ideas. She wanted to write about the garden, but also write about her own life and her own experiences. So um, she was my, with the creative writing program, There, you take uh, six courses, and then the seventh is a called the Final Project Tutorial. Mm -hmm. And it's about a third of a book that you have to finish for that. So she was my Final Project student. And we worked for about, we worked together on the first third of what has now become Unearthed, and it's mm. coming out in uh, this summer, both in the States and in Canada. That's great. So it's really exciting for her. Uh, what are some of the challenges that came up working on that book? When she came to me originally, mm. she had a lot of story ideas, a lot of storylines that she was trying to blend. And that was one of the issues was how to, which ones were the most important ones, which ones would make the best story. Mm -hmm. it, too many storylines become complicated. So, and also what was the primary relationship that the book was about? Because um, usually there is some sort of relationship, some sort of tension that exists. And, and it, it took a, a bit to get from her, a lot of talking and looking at drafts to get from her what it was she really wanted to write about. Mm. Um, and it ended up being something that initially, I think she didn't want to write about, or was a little, she admitted to me she was a little afraid to write about it. She didn't think it would interest people. Mm. She didn't realize there was any universal element to it. Mm. But it was her, uh, just her relationship with her parents, which was quite difficult. And, um, and one of them, her father had already died, and her mother was still alive, but was failing at the time that she was writing the book. So it was uh, kind of pulling some of that uh, together and right. pulling it out of her. Um, 
she says that one of the things I helped her do was, was keep her eye on the end of the book. I, I told her that she needs to think about what she wanted the book to be about and what, what it, it, the message would be for the reader, mm -hmm. and then be able to go back and decide what elements she wanted to keep to get to that goal. Um, and also, an editor's role is just to point out gaps and mm -hmm. weaknesses here and there, questions that come to you that you know will come to a reader, but uh, often the author is too too close to it to see that those are questions they haven't answered. But it must be very gratifying to um, come see it come together from the beginning to the end. It's yeah. what I love. Yeah. I love uh, working with authors. I love working at any stage of editing a book for a publisher, mm -hmm. but I also love uh, working with students and seeing, even when students publish something, you know, a 1,000 word essay somewhere that mm -hmm. I know has come out of some inspiration they receive from the class uh, or my workshops, I, I just feel so so proud of them, <laughs> so happy. Now people are documenting their lives on social media all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of that sort of personal writing? I think it's great that there's a, a, an opportunity now for mm -hmm. people, again this is something that's changed in the time I've been um, teaching. Now I can say to students, look you can start a blog in 10 minutes and start putting your writing out there. Yeah. You don't have to even worry about whether you want to send it to a journal and get rejected. If, you just, if what you want is to write and be read, that's the way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But of course there's a whole range of um, you know, quality out there and the ones that are better Get, get read more mm -hmm. and, uh, and become more popular and so on. I don't think it's a bad thing, but mm -hmm. as with any kind of reading, we should be selective, I guess. Well, I want to show you a clip of no novelist Camilla Gibb with Pia Chattopadhyay last year about the difference between writing, fiction, and memoir. The difference, I suppose, in uh, approaching memoir, um, it, it's, for me, it's actually just a technical difference, which is, Okay, so one is actually based in, in more directly based in um, a known reality mm. rather than an imagined or invented reality. Um, but there's, there's, those questions about fact and fiction are very blurry for me. I think the idea that we remember, uh, memory itself is you know, an act of reconstruction. Um, memory itself chooses and, and picks what, what pieces we're going to assemble into some kind of narrative form. Um, it, 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 I think, you know, nonfiction has this element, memoir in particular, where we're relying on our own kind of memory. It has this element of fiction in it as well, and we use a lot of the same techniques, mm. I think, um, to, to craft a credible narrative. Any thoughts on what Camilla just said? Mm-hmm, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. She, uh, the, um, there's a Norman Levine, a, a, a famous author, once said, all life once lived is fiction. The idea being that as soon as something has happened, we are processing it and people are processing that differently. Psychological studies will show that witnesses to a crime within minutes, they all have, they can have different stories and different interpretations of what they've seen. So, um, so there is definitely, I think, with memoir, there is always that element of, it's, it's both truth, mm -hmm your emotional truth, really, because what is truth, right? We can't, we have to, there's no, there are facts that you can verify, but there's a lot in memoirs that can't really be verified. Mm -hmm. But the truth of it is your emotional truth, the truth of your memory of what happened and how you interpreted it. So it's very personal. But fiction too, there's often elements of memoir in fiction, whether they're obvious or not. Mm -hmm. um, we all, people write fiction based on events that have happened to them, characters they've met sometimes become composites in a book. Um, you know, so there's a lot of overlap and both really are, are reality and imagination, but just in different degrees. Uh, we don't have very much time left, but I did want to follow up with that. Um, like James Fry a few years ago was criticized for blurring the real and because it was written, his book, A Million Little Pieces, was memoir, but mm -hmm. then it turned out that some of the details didn't really happen the way he remembered them mm -hmm. happening. So what do you say when that something like that happens? Well, hopefully people are being a lot more careful now. Mm -hmm. It's he, his was So the onus is on the writer then. I would say yeah. so. The the uh, he was definitely not the first. There are all sorts of famous cases of that prior to that mm -hmm. and there've been some since then as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's definitely uh, something that 
is there is no point to me in writing a memoir unless you are being truthful. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that there are lots of ways to describe different types of writing. There's a whole spectrum of creative nonfiction. And so to me, it's it, as long as you label what you have, have written properly so mm -hmm. that you're not surprising anyone or being dishonest or misleading, then anything goes, really. You can do any form of that, just be honest about what it is you've, you've actually written. And final question, how realistic is it for a normal person like myself, someone who's not famous or celebrity or politician, to get their memoir published, to get a book deal? Published to get a book deal? Mm -hmm. It's very, very challenging. It's mm -hmm. very competitive out there, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what makes me passionate about teaching it is that there are so many other ways to get your stories out. And depending on who the audience is that you want to be reading it, whether it's family or friends, self-publishing is so much easier and cheaper than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, E-publishing, there are all sorts of ways. Getting a book deal with a major publisher is 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 challenging. You have to have a lot of elements come together. Great story, great writing, um, you know, sometimes just the right editor reading it in-house and deciding that they want to go to bat for it with their editorial committee. So it's, there's a lot. But like you said at the beginning of the show, if you do it for yourself and you give it to your family, it's something that generations of your family can have for years to come, and that's, which is probably priceless. And that is. Everybody has a story to tell, mm -hmm. stories to tell. And for me, the main thing is that I want people to understand that. If they want to go to other levels of sharing their story, that's great. Mm -hmm. But first and foremost, I love to teach students that they can share their story with, their, with close, people close to them. Allison, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for and having me. And for helping me. us dig deeper. Thank you. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.